OK, today we're going to be using Charles Tilley's work to summarise all the different topics we've been looking at in the module and thinking about his theory. And it's up to you to decide whether you agree or not with the theory. And what I'd like you to do um, is to email me with a few thoughts about um, what you think about Charles Tilley's theories and whether you agree or not. Or you can put them on the discussion board on StudyNet. So to start off with, with mainly focusing on his book Popular Contention in Great Britain because it covers our period but he's written many other books which are along the same lines and we'll be looking at his methods in a minute but I'll just remind you of some of his main arguments that we've already been over. So he argues that there's a big change between the 18th and 19th century in terms of the way in which people put forward demands and protest and the reasons behind that shift are these four big sort of catchwords, as he calls them. So war is a big reason. Parliamentarization, if I can say it right, um, is the increasing importance of parliament in decision making. Capitalization, I, the coming of the free market economy, and proletarianization, um, the increasing concentration of working class people working in big industries. These are the four changes that he says um, are the drivers behind the shifts in types of protest. So you'll have seen this table before, but we'll quickly go through it in more detail. So this shift between what he calls contentious gatherings in the 18th century towards collective action in the 19th century. And essentially we're moving from local to national, um, violent but also intermediary to autonomous and less violent and particular or sort of specific protest towards much more transferable types of protest. So in the 18th century he argues people used kind of caricature or um, temporarily assumed local authority sort of ways of action. Can you think of any types of protest that did that? In the 19th century, he argues, then they move towards using types of action that the authorities don't use, their own types of autonomous action. In the 18th century, local protests converge on the residences or places where they feel they've been wronged by people. So it's much more direct. Whereas in the 19th century, people move towards much more um, organised protests in public places that are specifically designed for all types of protest. Can you think of any uh, types of protest that do that? In the 18th century, protesters often used already organised public celebrations or events like civic events, um, elections, um, national feast days to present their, their grievances. Whereas in the 19th century, they don't do that. They use their own days and choose their own events to um, present their grievances. In the 18th century, people are pre presented in traditional forms of corporate groups like guilds, um, which don't have anything specifically to do with the grievance that they're making. Whereas in the 19th century, people um, are formed in their own societies, their own associations, trade unions, um, that are specifically designed to put forward that grievance. In the 18th century, although we've seen that protesters act directly against local enemies, um, they also use intermediaries, so people who they feel can intercede for them and represent them in, in higher powers. Whereas in the 19th century, they directly challenge the national symbols of power, the national sources of power. Can you think of any examples that that occurs? In the 18th century, there's a lot of riot, as we know, and also those riots include Sharivari, symbols such as effigies, dumb show, ritual objects, um, as a way of asserting community justice. Whereas in the 19th century, that sense of local identity and um, customary belief is neutralised or shaped in a different way through 
other types of symbols such as flags, um, banners, colours, which types of flags um, and particular slogans. In the 18th century, as we've said, things are very customary in shapes of particular localities, whereas in the 19th century, um, forms of action are quite easily sort of used everywhere. They're not specifically local. OK, so the handout for this week is available on week 12 study net and it gives you the, the summary there um, in the table. But what it also does is give you um, an insight into the methods that Charles Tilly used. And so I encourage you to read through the handout and read through popular contention in Great Britain to see what you think. And so the rest of this um, piece is about you using your own brain to think about do I agree with this method or do I not? What are the advantages and disadvantages of this method? So Charles Tilley, this in the 1980s, 1990s, um, basically set up a research project which in some senses is prefiguring what digital historians do now with all the digitised newspapers, but he had to do it kind of analogue using printed copies of newspapers. So newspaper reports are his main evidence. Um, he mainly focused on newspapers from the southeast of England, but he also used the Times. Um, and what he did was get a load of researchers to go through and count through all the different reports of protests and particularly pay attention to particular words that were used in the reports and count up what percentage of the reports used these particular words. And there's a whole list in the handout. I've just picked out some of them. Um, and these words encompass sort of related words in the thesaurus. So it's not just these particular words, but words related to them. Um, but he counted up how many reports use the word, for example, attack in reports of protest. And so you can see there that in 1758 to 81, the reports um, had about 17.4% of reports use that word. Whereas in 1789 to 1811, it was only 4.7%. In 1819, it was 3.8%. In 1820, it was 2.8%. Whereas you compare that with, for example, the word resolve at the bottom of the table, um, it's only found in 1.6% of reports in the early period. And by 1819, 23.4% of reports use the word resolve. So what does that tell us? What what argument does that back in terms of Charles Tilley's model of how protests changed over time? Just give you a minute to think of that. Okay, can you see how Tilley's using that argument to say why he thinks that protests in the 19th century is less violent than protest in the 18th century, that you don't have that use of the word attack as often, and some of the other words like fight or move. Um, and whereas words like cheer or resolve or meet increase in frequency over time. So therefore, he's arguing that protest becomes less violent. Now I'd like you to write down what you think the disadvantages of that or the flaws of this method are. So think about the types of sources he's using, look at the table, um, the spread of the years, what, what are the problems with that type of method? Okay. Um, I've also pulled out another table from the same pages, which perhaps is a bit more convincing. Um, and here he's grouping the types of events that the protests um, can be classed under. Again, look at the, the chronology there and his choice of years and the choice of newspapers. Um, but here we've got him classifying things as attacks on persons and property. And look how they decline over time. The seizure of food or property, i.e. food riots. 
meeting to communicate with national government. So the big petition protests, elections and strikes or gathering for wage demands. So write down any comments you might have on that table. What are its advantages? What do you think are its flaws? Okay, the rest of the handout has got um, the information about how he's actually done it in particular. I'm just going to rotate the view so you can see it. Um, so this is from another book by Diane McAdam, Social Movements and Networks, um, but it's Charles Tilly's um, chapter in there. And again, you've got him trying to classify all the different types of protests that happened, particularly in the 1830s. Um, but here you've got on the bottom right hand corner, the words that he's looking for in the newspaper articles. So, for example, as I said, the word attack, he's classifying that with words like batter, battle, decry, whereas cheer, um, he, also the words applaud and thank are in there. So those are the types of words that he's looking for. Um, and he's found the full data set includes about 2000 different verbs, which is reduced to eight categories. Um, in some ways, this is, as I said, prefiguring digital history in the ways this is what um, digital historians do in terms of text mining and um, looking for frequencies of words. But he's doing all this manually using research assistants and um, writing things out. Um, so in some ways, it was actually a very ambitious and, and broad ranging project. And now it's quite easy to look for those words in a keyword search in newspapers online. But there, if you're doing it by hand, it's um, a huge job. So we've got to give him some credit um, in terms of being able to do this. Here we've got his um, bit more detailed in terms of he's broken it down by county trying to see if there's a difference um in the 1820s and the 1830s remember this is the time of the reform bill riots and also the swing riots um in terms of the frequency in which those words were used in different counties so i recommend you read this in in detail to see what he did what he did um here's from popular contention in great britain and this is a graph sort of showing his classification of why he sort of argues that um, types of violent gathering decline over the period, whereas public meetings increase. Um, so some of his conclusions are at the bottom of the page. Crowds, repressive formations and economically designated groups fell from major to minor importance in British contention. Parliament rose from insignificance in the 1750s to a dominant position. Um, and then there's got some more conclusions there, but here's another graph of the, the use of the, um, the words such as deliberate, claim, control and attack. And it's got a bit more about his methods here. Um, again, I'd like you to read this in detail and see what you think are its flaws and what do you think are its advantages. Um, his sample size is over 8,000, which again, at the time is huge, seeing as he's doing this manually. Now it'd be quite easy to do that online, find 8,000 records, but then manually it's, it's a lot. But I'd like to think about the scope of the number of newspapers he's looking at and the, the regionality of the newspapers he's looking at, um, whether we can actually use words in a newspaper report and their frequency to um, really quantify whether a, a protest is more violent or less violent, um, and any other sort of things you might think are a bit dodgy with his um, methodology if you read this in detail. Um, the last page in the handout is um, a description of how um, more broadly historians have looked at um, protest in this period and how actually most historians argue that the period 1790 to 1835 is a major 
um, turning point in the way that protest changes in this period.